Well, girls, it has been a privilege and an honor to be here with you and be able to share some of these things. And I'm so thankful that we have one more time together. And I'm praying that whatever God has been doing in your heart over Friday and Saturday and out into today, that he would finish it here. And that we would come to a place where we make some decisions about who we believe that he is and what we believe that he can do in our lives. And that we would leave here marked and changed And we would know that no matter what comes, that we will live lives that are not shaken because we're held together by the power of God. So we remember our theme verse comes from Psalm 55. And it tells us that we're supposed to cast our burdens on the Lord. And then we have the promise that he will sustain us. And the final part of that verse says that he will never allow the righteous to be shaken. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, not being shaken, We want to be able to stand firm and be settled and firmly persistent because if we are women that get tossed about and get shaken, we're not a lot of good to ourselves and we're not a lot of good to anyone around us. We want the Lord to make us firmly rooted, women that don't move, that don't swerve, but we're not shaken. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4. In verse 35 is where we're going to start. As I was thinking about this, I was, I was praying through it, and I really felt like there were three foundational things that we need to settle. These are not the only three, but these are the three that I really felt like I needed to talk to you about this morning. There are three things that sometimes I think we lack, and if we don't have these things, we really can't cast our burdens on the Lord and be sustained. We have to settle some things in our hearts first. And the first thing that I think we have when we have trials or burdens or difficulty is I think we have a lack of faith fundamentally, at its foundation, at the very foundation of our lives, we have a lack of faith in who God is. In this story, Jesus had been teaching, and in verse 35, it says this, On that day, when evening came, he said to them, his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Now remember, these guys were fishermen. These guys are accustomed to the the sea storming and the waves. They know how to handle a boat. They're familiar with the water. And they get into a storm. Jesus is sleeping. And the boat is filling up evidently faster than they can bail it out. And they realize they're in real trouble here. They've tried to do this a little bit in their own strength. And they realize, we're going to die. So they come over to Jesus and they wake him up and say, Hey, don't you care? We're we're about to die here. We're going to perish. And man, there's so much in that question. They don't wake him up with an explanation. They don't wake him up to ask him for help. They wake him up with an accusation. You told us to get in this boat, and we did that, and you have put us in the path of this storm, and you don't even care? You don't care we're going to die? You're asleep? I was thinking about, we do that sometimes. We get in the middle of a burden, we get in the middle of a storm, and that's kind of the question of our heart. Like, don't you even care that I'm here? You've allowed this to come into my life? You must not care about me. What kind of God are you that you'd put me in the path of the storm, that you'd allow me to be afraid like this? You're no longer good. You're not judging righteously. Do you even see my mess? Do you see my burden? Have you abandoned me? Because I'm in the middle of a storm here. Why am I sick? Why don't I have enough money? Why am I afraid? Why is my future uncertain? Don't you care? As though God is supposed to be some kind of umbrella that just keeps everything out of our lives. Only good things are supposed to pass through. He's never going to let us go into a storm is kind of what we think when we ask that question. If it's hard, he must not be good. If it's hard, he must not be fair. If it's hard, he must not care that I'm perishing. And the areas in which we're shaken reveal the areas in our lives that we don't trust the Lord. What's the area that you freak out about? Is it your health? Is it money? Is it a job? Is it your kids? That's a spot where you don't trust God. Fundamentally, at the base level, 
That's the problem. You don't trust him with those things. Because if you look in verse 35, Jesus said, guys, let's go to the other side. That was the word that was spoken out of his mouth. We're going to go to the other side. Did the fact that they found themselves in the storm make his word suddenly not true? Is he now a liar? He told them where they were going and exactly what was going to happen. And along the way, they encountered a tempest. And they were afraid. And Jesus, in such grace and compassion and mercy, doesn't get up and reprimand them. He just gets up and he says, Peace be still to the storm. And in verse 5, 1, we see they came to the other side of the sea, just like he said they would. But he asks them a question in verse 40. After he tells the sea to be still, he looks at them and he says, Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? And maybe this morning he's asking somebody that question. Why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith in that circumstance? Don't you know who I am? Don't you trust my word and what I said? But so often our faith in God is tied to our circumstances. We think if our life is good, then our God must be good. Well, then he's fair. Then he's faithful. But when things get a little shaky, suddenly God is no longer good. And we make a lot of assumptions about his character when we're in the storm. We assume things about who he is. We think he could rescue me, but he doesn't. And so we indict his character and we indict the very word of God because we're in the middle of a mess. We live in a house that was built in the 70s in all of its glory. When we moved in, it had shag carpet. does not anymore. We're slowly taking it over room by room. But we have this electric baseboard heat that we don't really use. We use a wood stove. But we have this electric heat, which means we don't have any duct work. And because we don't have any ductwork, we don't have any air conditioning, which is mostly fine, except for a couple weeks in the summer when it's really hot, but it's okay. My mother-in-law has a pool, and so when it gets really hot, I'll take all the kids over there, and they'll swim around, and all my kids have learned to swim in that pool. And I remember I had one of my kids, and he was probably about three and a half, and he had been swimming around the summer before with his little floaties on and loving the water. And we had kind of begun to get back in the pool the next summer. So he's three and a half. And I wanted him to start to learn how to swim without the floaties. In the event he fell in, I just felt like it would be good if you could not die, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had taken his floaties off. I was in the pool. Like, the water's here. I can see everything that's going on. And so I'm like, come here, you know, and I grab him. And he's like clinging to me like maybe I'm going to drown him or something. I don't know, like legs around my waist, clinging to my neck, freaked out. And so I kind of like loosen him like, you know, off me. And he's like holding on, like I could have just lifted like this and he would have just been hanging off my arm. <laughs> he was just, I don't know why he was so scared, but freaking out. And so I started to try to put him on his belly. Like I'm going to hold you in the water. I'm not going to drop you. I'm trying to just kind of put him on his belly so he could learn to float and like let's kick around the pool and this is what it would be like to swim without floaties because someday you need to do this. And he lost it. I mean, just completely wigged out. And so finally I, I gave up and, and I didn't try. And it was kind of funny in the moment, but at the same time I was thinking like, what kind of a mom do you think that I am? Like, I'm not going to save you from drowning in the water, you know? <laughs> Like, I'm just going to, oh, there you go. Have a good time. And it's kind of funny, but that's how we feel about God in trial. Like, what kind of a God do we think that he is? He's going to put us in the storm, and he's going to let the water overflow us, and he's going to let us drown? Is that what we think of our God? Is that the character and the nature of the Lord that we serve? Just like I had complete control of that situation and my little son in the water, I could see all around. I could carry his little body weight. I could direct him where I wanted him to go in the water, and I could put him out of the water onto dry land whenever I chose to do that. In the same way, God has complete control over your circumstance and your storm. I don't know if you acknowledge that or not, or you accept that, or you live like that. But that's what is true. 
The Bible tells us that we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. And it's a hope that is sure, and it's a hope that is steadfast. And you need to understand there is no other anchor. There is no other foundation. This is it. Every other foundation will crumble. Every other anchor will give way. But girls, why do we need an anchor unless we're sometimes in a storm? But he says, even in the storm, I'm the anchor. I'm not going to let you drift too far. I see where you're going. I know exactly what's happening. He never promised us immunity from trial. Sometimes we, we wish that was the case, but that's not what he promised. But he promised that we could cast that trial upon him, that he would help sustain us through it. And he promised that the trial would not overcome us, that we could even have victory over it. That's the promise. Things might knock us off balance sometimes, but as believers in Jesus Christ, we're supposed to get back up. We're supposed to walk in the victory that the blood of Jesus Christ purchased for us because he helps us stand. He helps us keep our place. And we have to trust that when we're in the storm, that he's going to meet us there. The disciples were not alone in the storm. Those boys yesterday were not alone in the fire. God himself was with them. And he asked, why are you guys anxious? I am the creator of the ends of the earth. I have everything in my power, everything in my control. Do we think that we have the circumstance that he can't touch? We have the one thing that he isn't capable of fixing, that he isn't capable of sustaining us through. In a minute, we're going to be in Isaiah 50. And girls, what is so important to understand is that sometimes faith is a choice. If you're waiting for the day when you're just going to have no fear and no doubt and be just a woman of faith that stands and all of that's gone, I'm going to tell you something, that's not going to happen. Because I don't care how strong of a believer you are, you're still going to be tempted to be anxious. You're going to be tempted to doubt. You're going to face things that are scary because that's why we need the Lord. And it gives us a greater dependency on him. Sometimes we choose to have faith. It's a choice we make, and that's what faith is. I mean, the Bible says that faith is the assurance of things that, is, that are hoped for. We're sure that something's going to happen that we're hoping for. We're sure he's going to save us. We're sure he's going to bring us safely to eternity. We don't see it yet. It's something we hope for, an assurance. It's a conviction or a deeply held belief of something that we don't see. That's what faith is. When you're in the middle of the storm, when they were in the middle of the storm, they didn't see the other shore. All they could see was the waves crashing on their boat. But they knew they should have taken by faith. God is with me in this. There is a shore somewhere, and he said we're going to go to the other side. And I believe, even though I don't see it, I believe he's going to take me to the other side. Isaiah 50, verse 7 says this. For the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Skip down to verse 10. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Sometimes that's what a trial feels like. We're walking in darkness and we have no light. But look what it says. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. In those moments of darkness, when you feel it's dark and you have no light, it says we trust in the name of the Lord. We set our face like flint, which is a hard stone, and we know we will not be ashamed. We fix our eyes on Christ. We don't look at the things that we can't understand. We don't allow them to consume us with doubt and with fear. We set our face like flint, knowing we will not be ashamed because he is with us. We trust and sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes your bills are greater than the money you're coming in, and you're not exactly sure how he's going to provide for you, but you know that he said he would provide. And so you're wise, you try to make good choices, and you wait for him to do that because he promised. It doesn't always make logical sense. Maybe you don't know how he could be, bring peace to a situation or reconcile some relationship that seems so broken. 
but you do your part and you stand on his word and you pray. And even if it doesn't make sense, you trust him because you set your face like flint. And we trust in his power and his presence, especially when we can't imagine how we could possibly do what's in his word. That's what faith is. And that's a choice. You're either going to decide to take him at his word or you're not. And we do that by deciding to believe what is true. Not how we feel, not how things seem, not what we think, maybe not even what someone else thinks and they want to tell you their opinion. We come all the way back to the word of God. What is true? What did he say? What can I stand on? What can I build my life on? That's the only firm foundation. And that's revealed in scripture. It's revealed through past experience as you've seen him sustain you before. You have hope that he'll do it again. In the lives of other believers, sometimes you can hear testimonies. I know you heard some yesterday of how God sustained. And you gain faith thinking, you know what, if he did it for her, maybe he'll do it for me. And you stand on that. And you wait. Is God who he says he is? The Bible says that he promised to work everything for our good. Is that true or not? If that's true, then he's not going to let pain be in your life without bringing purpose from it. He's promised that, and we can rely on that. Because otherwise, he's not a good father. If on a whim he just lets things into your life, that's not a good dad. Unless he sees there's purpose in this. I'm going to let you walk in this fire. I'm going to allow you to go into this storm. I'm with you in it. I will sustain you through it, and I will bring purpose from it. And sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes we go through things where you just think, I don't know how you could possibly bring purpose from this. I've been there. Like, God, I don't know. You, this is such a, an ash heap. I don't know how you could possibly bring something beautiful from this. But with time, and you look back and you start to see I still maybe didn't like that I had to go through that, but I see the purpose. I see why. I see you use it. And you can trust him to do that in your life. And sometimes, girls, what our, our struggle is about is answering the question, is he still good? Is he still faithful when my circumstances are not? Can I still trust him when I don't understand? And I'm going to tell you, if you can answer that question in your heart, It's not that you won't have trials, it's not that you won't have difficulty, but they're not going to knock you off balance like they did before you answered that question. Because you can say, I don't understand this, I don't necessarily like this, but I trust that you are good, that you will not allow pain without purpose, and I'm going to trust on that, I'm going to set my life on that, and I'm going to believe you're going to do something with this mess. Paul said in Corinthians, he said that he was burdened excessively beyond his strength, So he despaired even of his life. You ever been there in a trial where you're like, I don't know if I'm coming out of this one alive. This is the one that might just take me down. But he says that happened so that we would learn to trust not in ourselves, but in God. That was part of the purpose of that trial for him. And he says, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. And you can hear the faith on that. We despaired of our lives, but he will yet deliver me. I was in a place I thought I might die, he's saying. But I set my face like flint, and I said, he is the one on whom I've set my hope, and he will deliver me. Somehow, some way, I don't know how, but I trust that that's true. Because we know that he's in control, and that's why we can say, even if the earth shakes, even if the mountains fall into the sea, I can trust the one that created them. He's the one that made them. He holds them in his hands. In uncertainty, we have certainty in Christ because we receive a kingdom that will never be shaken. It cannot be shaken. So we can either try to do it on our own and we can fail and we can be afraid and we can be anxious or we can decide that we're going to trust the Lord and we're going to stand firm and we're going to wait patiently. So girls, we have to settle that faith question. We're shaken sometimes because we have a lack of faith. And we're shaken because we have a lack of surrender. Go back to Daniel chapter 3. There are a couple things in our story from yesterday I wanted to highlight. 
In verse 17, these boys have just told King Nebuchadnezzar that they don't have to give him an answer in regard to the fire and bowing and all of that stuff. And they say, in 317, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. There's surrender in that. They're saying, I know my God is able to save me. I know if he wanted to, he could rescue me from this. He has the power to do it. But if he does not, I will surrender my body to the flames. I will stand firm. I will do what he asked me to do. I will be who he called me to be. Literally to the point of their death. That's where they were. They didn't know if God was going to save them. They thought they might perish in those flames. We on the other side of that, we know the story. But they were prepared to go all the way to death in surrender. Why? Because they knew his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. What does the Bible say? As far as the heavens are above the earth, so much higher are his thoughts than our thoughts and his ways than our ways. There's an element of this saying, I don't understand it, I don't like it, but I trust that you are God and I am not. I have limited understanding. I have purposes and plans that are different from yours. And where mine and yours conflict, I'll surrender my will to your will because they are unsearchably higher. But we exalt our will and our plans and our purposes over his. We think we have a better way. We would have worked it out differently. We would have acted sooner. We would have done it through this means, through that money, that resource, that way. We somehow think we know better, and we seek our own will is what's true. We seek our own comfort. But at the time, girls, at the moment that you trusted Christ for salvation, you said something. What does it say? We confess Jesus as what? Lord, right? We're really good at the Savior part. We want the salvation. We don't want to go to hell. Save me, O oh Lord. Take my sin burden. I want the peace. I want the joy. Do I want the Lord part? I don't know. Because that means something, doesn't it? That means suddenly my life is not my own. And you get to tell me where to go. You get to take me where you want to. And you get to do with me what you want. And there is surrender in that. Not my will, but yours be done. He's Lord. We are not. I think about Jesus in the garden when he's praying. Talk about a guy that didn't want to do something to the point that he is bleeding or he's sweating blood. God, if there's some other way, if salvation can come for these people by some other means, please, Lord, up all night begging the Father, if I don't have to walk this path, please. But then he says what? Yet, not my will, but yours be done. If it means I surrender my body all the way to the cross because that's the only way salvation comes for these people, I'd like it to be a different way. I want it to be less painful, less difficult, but... If this is the plan and this is the way, not my will, but yours be done. Surrender. There are things we'd rather not walk through. The fire doesn't feel good. The storm is scary. But I'm his. And I trust that he has plans that I don't see. And he's working out a bigger picture that I can't understand. And Job said, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Will you surrender to him, even if it sometimes means that we walk through the fire? Can you trust that if he put you there and he allowed that to come into your life, that he is weaving a plan that you can't see and you don't understand? And trust him in it. Not quit, not be discouraged, but accept it and fight all the way through it. So girls, we have a lack of faith. We have a lack of surrender. 
And the last thing is we have a lack of perspective. When we're in the trial, we only see ourselves and the difficulty. How can I get out of this quickly? We don't focus on the Lord who provides and fortifies. We just focus on ourselves. There's a little fragment of a verse in Revelation that says that the church there persevered for his name's sake. Some of us girls, we want to be used, but we don't really want it to cost us anything. It's kind of like wanting to be in shape without working out. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. You know, we we want the fruit of the fire. We want the result of the storm on the other side, but we don't want to have to go through it. But look at what it says back in Daniel uh, 3.27. Nebuchadnezzar sees that these guys are not consumed by the fire, and he tells them to come out. It says the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Isn't that incredible? They come all the way out of this fire, and they don't even smell like smoke. There's not a single hair on their head that is singed. Talk about the preserving power of God bringing them through the fire. That's incredible. And he says in verse 28, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, in the fire girls, trusted in him, in the fire, violating the king's command, and they yielded up their very bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no god who is able to deliver in this way. A testimony. They didn't know it. They just got all tied up and thrown into a fire, but God was building a testimony through their life. And he took a king that didn't love, didn't fear the Lord, didn't even know the Lord, and was forcing people to worship idols, and that very king all of a sudden turns aside, like, wow, what kind of a God is that? That you can go all the way into the fire... The guys that threw you in there are dead, but you guys come out and you don't even smell like smoke. It's confusing, but it makes people turn aside to see what kind of a God is this? And I'm going to tell you some of the most amazing testimonies have come from the most violent storms. As people turn aside to see what kind of a God could bring someone all the way through that. Those women, those men that have stood that have set their faces like flint, known they would not be ashamed, and trusted the Lord in the storm. There are women sitting all in this room that if you just talk to them, you would think, oh, they must come from a perfect family. They had all kinds of money. Their parents are still married. They were raised in the church. And then you sit and you talk to them a little bit, and you you dig down, and and you, you kind of scratch your head. What? You were in jail? You were abused? You were a list, right? You were all these different things. How can that be? Because on the other side of it, we don't smell like smoke. When Jesus brings us all the way through the fire, and that's what people should see. Our hair not singed. We don't smell like smoke. We have come all the way through the fire by the power of Jesus Christ. And that's the testimony. I have seen God bring healing in relationships through illness. I have seen people get saved through circumstances that just seem crazy, like they don't add up. And someone, someone just recently was telling me she had been struggling with cancer, actually, and she said, you know, this has been really hard. She's trying to do it right. She's a godly woman. She's like, this has been really hard, but you know what? I've been praying for my brother for a long time to come to know the Lord, and he's asking me questions. Why? Because she went into the fire, 
And she's allowing the Lord to sustain her to the other side. And that is confusing to people. It makes people look and wonder, hi, how they do that? In the psalm, it says that we have become a marvel to many because who our God is. They don't understand it. But so many times we don't get to see the fruit that's supposed to come from the fire and the storm because we don't want to be in it. And we don't bear it well. So the blessing that would come from that, we miss. So then we just have the burden. We just have the storm. Nothing to show for it. Girls, we have to remember, I love you. It's not about you. It's not about you in your marriage. It's not about you in your home, in your job, in your school, in your neighborhood. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's about him being able to use you as a tool in his hand to draw men to himself. If God has saved you, it's not for your comfort, but it's so he can use you according to his will, his way, his purposes. There's a verse in 2 Timothy that I love that I'm not going to have us turn to, but it says that God himself, Paul is saying, he stood with me, And he strengthened me so that all might hear the gospel. That's why it's about other people getting to experience the same salvation that you did through your life and the testimony that you live out. And look, girls, there are circumstances in my life, if I could change the circumstance, I would, but I would never change what God has brought out of it and how he's used those things. And in the, in the moment, sometimes they were hard and I didn't understand, but I have seen him weave purpose from my pain in ways that I never could have imagined. But you have to let him do that. You don't have to let him do that. You can run away. You cannot trust him. And sometimes, you know, look, I'm married to a guy, we end up in a lot of disasters, like <laughs> flat tires and canceled flights and things, vehicles stuck in mud. And sometimes that's really inconvenient. And there was a time in my life where I really griped about it. And I'm not saying I get it all right all the time, but there are times now where I try to make it my perspective, maybe this is about the gospel. Maybe I'm literally stuck in the mud because the tow guy needs to know the Lord. You know? <laughs> maybe the illness that sent you to the hospital is because there's some doctor there that is going to hell and you are the tool that the Lord has chosen to bring the gospel into that place. But we're so busy like, oh, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what's happening. We're all in a tizzy. And we have our eyes so much on ourselves that we forget that our perspective is to be eternal, not on the things that we see, but on the things that are not seen. Right? Because momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. So that's where our focus is, not on ourselves. we got to keep our perspective, ladies. It's about him. It's about the gospel. But so often we're not willing to suffer so that other people would be saved. And boy, am I glad Jesus didn't feel that way. He suffered so we might be saved. I'm not saying we search out suffering or we glorify it as though it somehow makes us more spiritual, but I'm saying if God allows that into your life, it's for something. And it's up to us to let him use it for something. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God was working a bigger purpose than they could see. What if they would have just bowed on the field to the idol because they didn't want to go in the fire? They would have missed it. We would have missed it. This story is still bearing fruit thousands of years later. We're still talking about them because of what God did. Because they went into the fire and they came out of the fire. It's not about us. It's not about this earth. It's not about this body. It's all going to pass away. We have to keep our perspective. We have to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ, his gospel, his plans, his purposes. In the book of Ephesians, I love what it says. It says, having done all, we stand. We keep our place. We stand in faith. We stand in surrender. And we stand with an eternal perspective because we should be about the gospel because we can't just take salvation and not extend it to somebody else. Did Christ come back? Are you dead? Then stand. That's what we're called to. 
And it's not an absence of pain, girls, but it's that we take our pain into the presence of a God that can help us bear it. Girls, some of us in here are holding God responsible for difficulties when instead we should be turning to him for help. God's a God who hears our cry. It is he who guards us and keeps us. It is on his faithfulness that our lives hang. He remembers his promises to his people. He's not forgotten you. He's not abandoned you. He's good when you're sick. He's good when you're hurting. He's good when you don't have any money. He's good when your marriage is bad and your kids are a wreck. He's good because he's good. And we can say, my circumstances might be hard, but my God is good. And we can trust him. He's trustworthy. Maybe you're wrestling here, trying to decide if God can be trusted. He can be trusted. And someone here just needs to make that decision. Decide today. I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to trust him. Come what may, I will trust him. And I promise you, put him to the test. He is trustworthy. Others, maybe somebody else, maybe you do trust him, but you're just so tired. The battle's been so long and so hard, and you just don't know if you have what it takes to even go another day. Maybe you just need to cry out to him and say, I'm weary and I'm tired, don't quit. Decide today, I'm not going to quit. Purpose in your heart. No matter what comes, I'm not going to stop fighting. I'll press into the Lord. I'll go one more day. Because somebody needs the testimony that you're building right now. They need the gospel being lived in your life. Girls, for someone in here, it's time to settle with the Lord. I just pray that you don't leave shaken. We're going to sing a song, and we're going to give you the opportunity. During this time, you can pray in your seat if you want. But I have some girls that are going to be against either wall here. And if you just want a sister in Christ for a minute to come with you and pray for you, to pray for you to have faith. There's this great story in Mark where the guy comes to Jesus and his boy is convulsing and possessed. And, and Jesus says, he says, you know, if you can, like, can you do something? And Jesus says, all things are possible to him who believes. And the guy says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Maybe you need to pray that. Help my unbelief. That's okay. And if you want a sister in Christ to pray with you, they're going to be at either side. Don't leave here not settled. You can trust him. He's a good God. And he will bring purpose from your pain.